M and M scoop entry number two twenty. Guys, I visited the old building that I discovered in the FNAF three files. I walked inside and learned of an unsolved mystery, an old unsolved mystery. It was fantastic. I mean, to think I actually visited a place that could be connected somehow to the FNAF game lore. I know, you probably want me to spill already, right? Well, I can't. I'm still piecing together information. This time, I want to have solid evidence before sharing everything I've learnt. I just want you to know that this investigation is so awesome and surreal. I love the FNAF universe. Eminem. <laughs> I keep saying like Eminem, like the rapper. Mom Spaghetti, uh, oh god, I forgot his accent, oh no, uh, you're back again, nope, that's Scottish, <laughs> you're back again, Jim the maintenance man at old cinemas said to Mandy as she walked through the hallway, it had taken her a good hour on the bus to get there, but it had been worth it to visit old cinemas again, she had one more day in Utah, and she was going to make good use of it, starting by comparing old photos she found on a website to the current layout of the movie theatre, yep, Trying to see the difference between sideshows and how the movie theatre is today, she waved her phone in the air. You're pretty dedicated, I'll give you that. Jim scratched his head. Yeah, there are a few rooms that we used then that are now closed off. Really? Like, which ones? The party room. Oh god, that's... <laughs> that is not the accent. The party room is now the storage room for some of the old stuff. Excitement shot through Mandy. Wow, can I see it? Well, I don't know. The owner didn't know if he wanted to throw it all away, and then he just stored it. But it's been sitting there ever since. Oh please, this would be so cool for the blog. Jim shrugged. Guess it'll be okay. But don't be touching anything. I can't have you getting hurt because then I'd be in trouble. Liability and all that. Mandy crossed her chunky black boots. Promise. Alright, oh hello Mrs. Robbins. <laughs> Jim practically bowed his head in greeting. The woman smiled. Her hair was brown with grey streaks, her face slightly lined. She clutched her purse to her side, and there was something about her that seemed really unhappy. For some reason, Mandy suddenly felt the same feeling in the centre of her chest. It was familiar to her. She felt it many times alone at home, a feeling of emptiness and ultimate sadness. A feeling that Mandy sometimes thought would never go away. Hello, Jim. Good to see you today, the woman said. You too. Enjoy the show. The woman walked into the cinema room. That's Mrs. Robbins, Jim said when she was out of his earshot. Uh, Mandy noticed, ab uh, sorry, na Mandy nodded absently. That's the mother. Mandy's eyes nearly popped out of her head. Stevie's mother? For real? Shh. She comes here a couple of times a week, ever since old cinemas opened. One of the nicest ladies you'll ever meet. But you leave her alone, yeah? Poor woman's been through enough. Come on, I'll show you the storage room. Mandy followed Jim down the hallway, focusing her thoughts on Mrs. Robbins. Jim had said Stevie's mum had brought him to sideshows every, nearly every day, and now she visits old cinemas in remembrance of her missing son. How sad was that? Jim halted and fished out the key from his keyring. He unlocked and pushed open the door, then turned on the light. The light only lit the centre of the room. Some of the other lights were apparently burned out. The windows were lined with old newspapers and there were stacks of boxes and old tables and chairs. Be careful, I'll just be down the hall. Thank you. When Jim left, Mandy took out Bobby's framed photo. She hooked the small photo stand on the zipper of her sweatshirt. There, so you can have a good view of all this amazing stuff with me. Mandy stepped through rows of boxes and packages. A musty smell tingled her nose and she sneezed. Against the far wall, she discovered a large, old yellow sign. Sideshow sa side Snack Shack was printed in bold letters, and a plain brown bear waved his hand. Mandy snapped a photo of it. There were boxes with party hats and unused balloons with Sideshow printed on them. Rolled up posters were propped in one corner. She found dusty takeout bags with the bear printed on them. A frayed grand opening banner was dropped in the centre of the room. The idea that Five Nights at Freddy's could be based on this real life, life event, Bobby, is super epic. I mean, I really feel bad for the little boy and Mrs. Robbins, though. She had a real sense of sadness to her. Sometimes when I miss you, I feel sad like that. Mandy turned in a circle and flinched in surprise. A shadowed form was lurking in a far darkened corner. Sheesh, what was that? Mandy stepped closer, peering into the dark. Her pulse sped up because whatever was in the corner made her feel uneasy. Um... I know we should see what that is, but something tells me I really don't want to. 
Mandy picked her way carefully to the corner of the room and the shape resolved into that... <coughs> Sorry, of a bear. Her previous thought came flooding back to her. All that's missing is the possessed animatronic. She jumped up in excitement and Bobby's picture fell to the floor. Oh shoot. She picked Bobby up and hooked the frame stand into her front, front pants, pants pocket. Sorry about that. She walked a little closer and took some photos of the old bear. Dust lined his flat brown fur that seemed to sag on the frame of the body. The bear's ears drooped and one eye was closed while the other stayed open. The mouth was sewn shut. How cool is this? She murmured. She peered closer to the bear and something awful filled her nostrils. A strange feeling of dread washed over her. Ooh, that's bad. Real bad. A mouse skittered across the bear's face and Mandy sprang back, waving a hand in front of her nose. I think this is our cue to go, Bobby. It stinks and I don't like mice. She turned away and jolted when, she, when the ghost appeared. His skin was greyish now, dark circles cupping his black eyes. His cheekbones were so hollow, the outline of his skull formed sharp edges under his skin. Dark veins lined his face like he was rotting within. His hair had thinned out and she could see parts of his skull. Worse, he looked hungry somehow. In this dark, cramped, terrifying place, Mandy felt the fear rise sharply within her. She could scream, but the props and boxes would likely dampen any sound. She felt the horror of her dreams could become a frightening reality at any moment. In a long shot attempt, Mandy immediately closed her eyes, willing the ghost to disappear. But when she opened her eyes, he was still there. Fear catapulted through her body anew. No, she breathed. Mandy took off, around a stack of boxes, hoping to escape. But as she rounded the corner, he reappeared. It was like he was surrounding her. She swallowed hard and whirled back in the direction of the bear. Ghost boy flashed in front of the bear and this time he did disappear. Mandy slammed a hand to her beating heart to literally try to hold it in since it felt like it wanted to pound right out of her chest. I think it's time we get out of here, Bobby, before he comes back. The ghost flashed again in front of the bear and then a newspaper clipping floated off a box onto the ground. Mandy crouched and hesitantly picked it up. The clipping was about the missing boy, Stevie Robbins, and there was his picture. Mandy gasped. You are Stevie Robbins. She looked up at the bear again, but Stevie was gone. Mandy wasn't sure how long she sat in that storage room, trying to wrap her head around the fact that the little boy who'd been haunting her was the same missing boy from Sideshow Snack Shack. Can you believe this, Bobby? She swallowed hard. Why would he haunt me? If he wanted someone to solve the mystery of his disappearance, why not haunt a famous detective? Hey girl, you're still in there? Uh, seeing Jim in the doorway, Mandy sprang to her feet. Yeah, still here, just finishing up. I found some old newspaper cl clippings. Okay, well, hurry up. My shift is ending soon and I gotta lock up. Okay, we will do, thanks. Mandy turned back to the bear in the corner. Stevie flashed in front of the bear once again. What are you trying to tell me, Stevie? She closed her eyes, trying to backtrack through the dreams. Stevie was always running from her, hiding just like he hid from his mother when it was time to go home. He was always in the FNAF games. He was always attacking her, she shivered. And now he kept flashing in front of the bear, luring her. She opened her eyes to see Stevie and peer in front of her. He climbed up, in, he climbed up the bear, turned its head, and then he disappeared. Mandy didn't want to go to the bear since it smelled really, really bad. She stepped closer, the smell getting stronger. Everything inside her told her to step away, to turn around and never come back. But she had to know what Stevie was trying to tell her. She had to solve the mystery and find the truth. Hesitantly, she stepped toward the bear, slapping a hand over her nose. Her stomach twisted and did a slow roll. She took a deep breath and held it as she used both hands to reach for the bear's head and twisted. The head clicked and a gear sounded, as if some inner device was unlocking. Mandy lifted the head slowly and set it down on a box. She pulled over a chair and climbed up, peering inside. It was too dark to see, but Mandy still saw more than she needed to see to put these pieces together. She clicked on her phone light, searching inside. She saw a little bit of brown hair and a top of a small skull and a patch of a bright red shirt. As she pieced together what she saw in her mind, terror gripped her entire body. She opened her mouth to scream, but nothing would come out. She jerked backward and fell off the chair, crashing to the floor. She couldn't scream. She couldn't breathe. She pushed to her feet and ran. 
You did it, girl. You found Stevie. Jim was saying to Mandy outside old cinemas where police scattered around the business. The day had turned overcast and Mandy started to shiver. All these years, he shook his head and waved his arm toward the movie house. I can't believe I never thought to check inside the bear. He was a hider. I should have checked any possible spot in the, li the little guy I could get into. After it was all over and the owner decided to close, we just sort of placed everything in the storage room and, locked and closed the doors. Never had to go inside. The snack shack was done. How'd you find him? What made you check inside the old slideshow? <laughs> he looked at Mandy expectantly, but if she could impart some sage wisdom... Uh, sorry, as if she could in impart some sta sage wisdom. But Mandy understood beneath his curiosity there was a layer of guilt. For years he'd been working around that building that the little dead boy was in, never realising the boy had been hidden there the entire time, just waiting for someone to find him. How could she tell him it was really all St Stevie's doing? That he'd led her, or scared her actually, into finding his body inside the old robotic bear. There still had to be DNA testing, but according to the size of the body and the clothes Stevie had seen, but been last seen in, the investigator had told her they were pretty confident it was indeed Stevie Robbins, who'd been missing for 17 long years. Back in the present, Mandy cleared her throat, closing, uh, crossing her arms. I'm not sure. I was just sort of curious about how the bear worked, and that's how I found him. Jim scratched his head. Well, I gotta hand it to you, kid. You did a good thing. Real good, Mrs. Robbins and this town are going to have some peace and finally grieve for little Stevie the right way. He looked at old cinemas and shook his head as he walked away. All these years. Mandy, I was so worried about you. Mandy's mum rushed to her. I'm sorry, mum. Mandy murmured against her as they hugged. Mum pulled back and rubbed her arms. How did this happen? You found a missing boy? Mandy swallowed so hard, trying not to cry. I found him inside the storage room. What were you doing looking inside the storage of this old place? It's a long story, mum. I don't even know where to begin. Okay, we'll talk about it later. Is it okay for you to leave? I don't know. Did you already give a statement to the police? Mandy nodded. Okay, let me find out. Mum did her power walk toward a, pa a police officer who directed her to the lead investigator. Mum talked and the investigator nodded, writing down something in a small notebook. A few minutes later, Mum marched back to Mandy and told her and took her hand. Let's go to the hotel. You can tell me all about this over room service. What about work, Mum? I know you have a lot of meetings. I didn't want to cause any problems for you. Work can be rescheduled. You're my daughter. You're my pro priority, sweetheart. As they started to leave, Mrs. Robbins caught them. She appeared uncertain, and there were tears on her cheeks. Her hands were fisted tightly around her purse strap, as if she might fall away if she let go. Hello, she said hesitantly. Are you Mandy? Hello, yes, this is Mandy, my daughter. Mum responded. Can we help you? I just wanted to say, Mrs. Robbins' voice cracked. My boy Stevie has been missing a long time. Seventeen years. Mum's face softened. I'm so sorry for your loss. Thank you. It's been awful, the not knowing. I would think about him every day, miss him all the time. I would wish he was safe back at home with me. I think the day I lost him, I stopped living a bit. He she sniffed. These have been the loneliest years of my life. And to think, all the time he's being here, he all this time he's been here, waiting, hiding like he used to. I always felt closer to him when I came here ev every week, and now I know why. Thank you so much for finally bringing my boy home to me. Thank you for bringing me peace. Mandy nodded, the knot in her throat growing so that she couldn't even swallow. She couldn't respond, so Mum did it for her. You're welcome. I'm glad he's finally home. Take care of yourself. Her mum guided Mandy to the car. A news reporter attempted to ask some questions, but mum was a pro and cut them off quickly. We'll call you later if we have a statement. We're just glad the boy was found. Thank you. Mandy and her mum got in the car and drove back to the hotel. That's when Mandy let the tears flow. Sweetie, it's okay. It's been an emotional day for you. You did a wonderful thing for that boy's mother. Remember that, Mandy. You brought that little boy home. No matter what her mum said to her, Mandy couldn't stop crying. Mum scheduled them an earlier flight home. She heard mum talking to dad on the phone. She was worried because Mandy wouldn't stop crying and, well, Mandy never cried. Hadn't since, uh, hadn't since she was a toddler. The flight was quick and she could feel her mum watching her as Mandy stared out the aeroplane window, clutching Mr Happy, tears flowing down her cheeks. 
It was like every box of emotions Mandia had stored away deep inside herself had burst open all at once, and all her feelings were pouring out of her like an unstoppable waterfall. Mandy felt only a sense of deep sadness that she didn't think would ever end. All the emotions made her feel very, very alone, even though she knew her mum was right next to her. Even though she clutched Mr. Happy to be closer to Bobby, it didn't help. Nothing will ever help. When they finally got home, Dad was actually there, dressed in sweats and a shirt. He embraced Mandy in a big, warm hug. Mandy let the floodgates open up wider and cried harder. Mandy Bear, it's okay, he said. Everything's going to be alright. I know it's shocking, what you've been through. Maybe we should call the doctor. I've never seen her like this. Mum was coming, unraveled. Her voice higher pitched than normal. It's been hours. She hasn't stopped crying. I don't know what to do. Mum always knew what to do. Dad guided Mandy to the couch and her parents sat on either side of her. Dad handed her a box of tissues, but Mandy couldn't look at them. She felt awful for acting like this, for her parents seeing her like this. She felt awful for all the crying, but she couldn't stop. She felt like a failure, that her parents were finally seeing the real her. The real Mandy, who was weak and depressing and a freak. The charade she'd been holding on to for so long was finally through, and she felt so guilty. I'm sorry, she managed to whisper. There's nothing to apologise for, Dad assured her and hugged her again. You're going to be okay. This will all pass. You're strong, Mandy Bear. You'll see. She shook her head. No, I'm not strong. Of course you are, Mum said. You're smart, you're strong-willed, and you're funny. You get the funny from your father, obviously. Mandy almost smiled at that, but she was so convinced she'd put on this act for so long that she disillusioned her parents. Mum, you don't know. What don't we know? I'm weak. I'm a freak. She pulled out a tissue and wiped her nose. Mandy Marie, I don't want to hear those words coming out of your mouth. Shh. Dad placed a hand on Mum's. Sweetie, you're not a freak. You're strong and unique. And we love you for who you are. Mandy shook her head. They all think so at school. No one talks to me like the person. They call me names, say mean things. They put things in my locker. I'm a freak to them. Mum jerked upright on the couch. Who are they? I'll go right to the school and talk to the dean. We'll fix everything. Is it the Chandler girl bothering you again? She is so spoiled. No, Mum, I don't want that. Mandy's voice cracked as she said. I'm just so sad all the time because... I'm lonely. She saw her parents meet gazes, and then they reached for each other as they cocooned their daughter in a big, strong embrace. Whew. This is tough to get through. <laughs> Mandy told them everything. Um, she told them all about Melissa and her friends, the bullying at school and how she'd taken it for so long and never let anyone see how much it hurt her that she was lonely at school and home and that she wished Bobby was here with them and had grown up with her. Her parents cried because they wanted Bobby to be with them too. She told them about her online community and how she immersed herself in the game law because it allowed her to be part of something she loved and that she was accepted there. She kept the part about Stevie's ghost to herself because, well, that might really push her parents over the edge. True. <laughs> but she did explain how she pieced the mystery together and ultimately found Stevie. That after solving the mystery, she thought she would feel good, but after discovering Stevie's body, it just made her feel worse. After experiencing Mrs. Robin's sadness, it had broken something open inside her. It was an unloading of epic proportions, something she had never done. Her parents finally got her to stop crying, or maybe she didn't have any more tears left inside her. Her mum put her to bed, and Mandy fell right into a dreamless sleep. Mandy took the rest of the week off from school, and so did her parents from work. She couldn't remember the last time they were home together for so many days, just to spend time together as a family, without school or work involved. They wanted Mandy to see a therapist, and she told them she would think about it. After freeing herself of everything she'd been holding in, she felt lighter, and not as lonely as she'd once felt. Maybe that was what, what what brought Stevie to her. He'd been alone for so long, and so had she. Now they were both coming out of hiding. She felt as if she escaped something terrible and she was ready to live her life again. M&M &M Scoop Entry Number 225 I solved a mystery regarding the building that I discovered in FNAF 3, everyone. I thought it would make me happy, but it didn't. It actually turned into an extremely sad adventure. 
where it started off thrilling and exciting and then finished in a way that was full of sorrow and grief. I've decided to not share details because something shouldn't be shared out of respect for families. I will say I learned a lot during this investigation and I will probably never know for certain how this mysterious building is connected to the FNAF universe. It could have been something as simple as inspiration. The only thing I am certain of is if the creator wanted us to know, I think he would tell us. M and M. I can't believe you found Stevie Robbins, Mandy, Lindy said into the video call. It's been all over the news. You're like a hero here. My brothers are so jealous that you're my best friend. They told a bunch of people and now kids at school keep asking me questions about you. It's been a crazy few days. Mandy smiled but shook her head. It was by total accident that I found him. Did you hear the little guy that had somehow broken his neck when sealing himself into the bear? Mandy recalled the dream when her hand slid into his neck. She shuddered. Poor Stevie, Mandy paused, then said. And just between you and me? Lindy nodded. Yeah? Promise you won't tell anyone? I promise. Cross my heart. Lindy crossed her heart on the video screen. The ghost boy? The one who'd been haunting me? It was Stevie Robbins. He somehow led me to him inside the bear. Lindy's mouth gaped open. Oh. My. Gosh. I don't really understand it either, but I can't deny that it all must have happened this way for a reason. Wow. There is something I don't understand though. Why did Stevie show up in my FNAF game dreams? Is it because I found the photo in the game files? I mean, what is the connection between FNAF and Stevie Robbins' disappearance? She sighed. I guess I'll never really know the answer, and that's okay with me. On Monday morning, Mandy walked through the halls of Donovan Prep. Her purple hair had faded to a light lavender and was down past her shoulders. She felt different walking through the school. Her shoulders were not so tight. Her nerves were actually calm. She wasn't bracing herself for a verbal attack because really, she just didn't care what Melissa and her friends had said anymore. It felt like she had, hadn't been to school in a month instead of a week, and she was really looking at the school with new green and brown eyes. <laughs> the floors were wooden and glowing with a wax shine. Trophies and old pictures were gleaming from the glass showcase. Girls didn't, I either didn't notice her, or they weren't giving her a wide berth anymore as she walked by them. This was her school too. She had learned a lot here and she was going to make a point of enjoying the remaining school year before she graduated, as it was also time to look ahead and plan for a future. Mandy realised she had allowed Melissa to steal her school experience away from her. She allowed her to take her happiness when no one should have that power over anyone. Mandy walked to her locker and spun the combo. She opened the door and sure enough, she heard a familiar voice behind her. Oh, look who's back. It's Macehead, the freak show, Melissa said, and giggles followed. Mandy took a breath and turned to face Melissa Ch uh, Chandler. Melissa's eyes widened. When Mandy leaned in close, Melissa had to tilt her head up and take a step back. In an incredibly calm voice, Mandy spoke to her. It's time for you to listen to me, Melissa. Mandy Mason is the only name you are allowed to call me. My name is not Freak Show. My name is not Macehead. I don't care who you are or who your friends are. Mandy looked at Lily and a couple of other girls, who just stared back in shock. You will not talk to me unless I'm facing you and have a conversation. Uh, unless I'm facing you and having a conversation, sorry. You will stay away from my locker and stop putting little ignorant pictures or notes or slime in my locker. Because if you do any more of that idiotic stuff, we will have a problem and I will not back down from you anymore. Melissa's blue eyes were like saucers, her face, face pale. I am done, do you understand me? Melissa made a smarmy face that basically said, yeah, right. But Mandy did not waver. Melissa and her friends no longer had power over her because she would not give it to them. Am I clear? She asked her, staring at Melissa's face and, and realising all this time she thought she was so perfect and pretty, when really she wore a ton of caked on makeup. That underneath... All the fake stuff. She was just a girl like the rest of the class at Donovan Prep. Crystal, Melissa said, and flipped her hair in an exaggerated turn as she sauntered away, with her gaggle of girls scurrying after her. Money turned back to her locker and saw a larger group of girls watching the encounter. In a sudden outburst, they started to applaud and whistle. Mandy felt her cheeks heat, and an embarrassing smile curved her mouth. Study period went smoothly. She didn't care that Melissa and Lily sat by her, 
only that they had finally heard her, finally realised that they can no longer bully or hurt her. Mandy did her schoolwork and she was, um, was happy when the bell rang to go home. She gathered her stuff and went back to her locker. When she opened her locker, she gasped, not because there was another note or a slime shooter, but because her longboard had been returned. Good to have you back, buddy, she murmured. She pulled it out with a book she needed for homework and closed the locker. A girl who had a locker close to Mandy's was standing by. Hi, she said. She had her black hair styled in two braids and clutched a couple books against her. Oh, hi, Mandy said. I'm Teresa. Mandy. She gave a shy smile. You were awesome this morning standing up to Melissa Chandler. That was pretty brave. Mandy shrugged. Oh, thanks. I'm just done with them and their drama. She nodded on understanding. I have a longboard too. Cool. Maybe you can show me sometime. Teresa smiled. I'd like that. See you tomorrow. Okay, bye. Mandy walked out of DP and rolled home, a smile on her face. That night, Mum was home. Mandy's parents had decided to work out a schedule so that Mandy wasn't alone so often. She told them they didn't have to do that, but they said it was time for some family changes. Mum wasn't going to be travelling as much and Dad would bring some of his work home instead of spending so many late nights in the office. <clears throat> as Mandy was about to go up the stairs to her room, she heard a light tap at the front door. Frowning, she turned and opened the door. Manny's eyes widened to see Stevie Robbins standing before her, whole, healthy and smiling. His colour was good, his brown eyes happy. She peeked over her shoulder to see if her mum was nearby, but she wasn't. Then she smiled at Stevie, the way he was supposed to look when he was a healthy little boy who once lived with his mother. Thank you, Mandy heard the words in her head. Mandy gave a nod. Stevie began to walk away. He turned back once more and waved. Bobby says hello. Mandy waved back as her heart clenched, watching Stevie disappear into the dark night. Whoa! I like that. Um, I see a lot of people... I, I've heard a lot of people's opinions on this story. Uh, obviously, I think they've only read the leaks, not the actual story. And they said that this is, like, the worst story in the world. I don't think it's that bad. Like, it's actually pretty good. Uh, it, it felt kind of similar, I guess, to Felix the Shark in the way it was kind of like a treasure hunting story for a lot of it. Uh, and it wasn't really a scary story either. And again, I don't think Felix the Shark was that scary of a story. Um, but it was good. I actually really liked it. Um, as I said, it was quite funny, honestly. I was laughing at quite a lot of it because it was like, oh, Five Nights at Freddy's 3. Damn, spring traps here. Uh, whatever. But I thought it was... It wasn't, it wasn't great, but it wasn't too bad. Like, I don't think it's the worst story. Um, I can see why it was cut, though. Uh, from the, uh, the other, you know, the other books. I can see why it's a scrap story. Uh, what I will say is one thing I just want to point out before I end, uh, is this? Yeah. Okay, so, one thing that I've completely forgot to say, uh, at the beginning of this book, which is, like, a huge thing that you need to know, is that this story was written by Scott Cawthon. Like, Scott Cawthon alone. This... The story wasn't written by an author. It was written by Scott Cawthon. Um, which may be why it's, l like, less good to some people, I guess. But also, it's, like, it's it might be Scott, like, trying to tell us some stuff. I will say I learned a lot during this investigation. I'll probably never know for certain how mis this mysterious building is connected to the FNAF universe. It could have been simple, something as simple as inspiration. There's a line right there. Oops, that's... Yeah, there's a line right there. Um, you know, like, not everything is going to mean something in the FNAF games. Yeah, uh, the, only thing I, the only thing that I am certain of is if the creator wanted us to know, I think he would tell us. I'm not sure if Scott would because, he, you know, he's gone silent. <laughs> he has retired now. But that is a good important thing to note. Like, if we're getting things... I guess, like, extremely wrong or extremely right, I think Scott would tell us, you know. Uh, I don't know. That's, that's just something to think about. Uh, the story was written by Scott. It was still pretty good, I think. Tell me what you guys think in the comments below. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for watching. Next time, 
we're going to the last Fazbear Fright story. Can you believe it? The last one we are doing. You're the band. And I'm telling you, you don't want to miss this one. This is such a good story. So, uh, yeah. I will see you then. Goodbye. <laughs>